Good morning, colleagues. Uh, John Sikazo is my name. I work for the World Bank office in Pretoria. Uh, I'm going to try and time myself so that uh, we don't run over schedule. Um, I used to be an engineer. Then, uh, yes, used to be, then someone changed uh, my trajectory. So now I deal with uh, things called procurement, whatever that means. Uh, so today we'll try and cover three things. One is for those of you who may not know, to go through a summary of our new procurement framework. So things have changed. And I think uh, those of you who are bidding on um, our projects uh, ought to know what has changed. Also, uh, to also look at the various business opportunities which are there for yourselves in energy and water. And um, also some recent developments in the space of environment, social health and safety, which I think most of our consultants in here uh, should become aware of. So effective July 2016, uh, there were some tectonic plates that moved within our institution. Uh, we did away with uh, the old guidelines for procurement and in came the new procurement framework. So it's meant to apply to what we call investment project financing, and it's only meant to be for all the projects effective uh, after the 1st of July, 2016. The key outlines um, of this particular framework is that it gives us the chance to use different things in different places, context specific. Also, it gives us an opportunity to be more flexible and um, as most of you have been complaining, uh, it moves things uh, quite significantly in that we will not be looking at it being like the way we do it, but it also looking at the way um, you also do it. So consistency instead of equivalence. Then, I think most importantly, uh, to ensure that whatever systems, methods we are using are achieving value for money. I will not read through each line uh, word for word, but there are seven core principles which are meant to be achieved by this new procurement framework. First of all, as I had said, it's value for money. Then the procurement methods should be fit for purpose. Obviously, they should lead to some economy and efficiency. The system itself must be one which reflects elements of integrity and Transparency, I think, must be key. People need to know what has gone on. And obviously, the element of fairness. Uh, those of you uh, with sharp eyes will see that um, something seems to be missing, something called competition. Uh, there's an official answer for it and also an unofficial answer for it, but we can discuss that over tea. So we are looking at an enhanced vision which is based on the seven core uh, principles. Some things have now been excluded from the bank's procurement framework. And this really is bank guarantees. Th these are not the bank guarantees uh, that contractors get from banks, but the guarantees that we provide for investment projects. Um, we have a few around uh, the world. Uh, the nearest one should be Morupule in Botswana. Those of you who are from Botswana maybe know about that particular power plant. Um, also, uh, we have seen the introduction of what we call the most advantageous bid, which is diametrically opposed to the lowest um, responsive bid. So you may be responsive, you may be lowest, but you may not be the most advantageous. So things have changed, additional criteria, criteria which is not pass or fail, but may include rating are now allowable for procurement of works. Uh, also, I think we are trying to move to something called fit for purpose. Uh, previously, we were accused of being uh, one-sided and that uh, we were looking at one size fits all. So again, it's trying to be context specific to the extent possible. We are also trying to emphasize on our clients uh, applying their minds as they do the procurement. Sometimes uh, everybody is accused of being very mechanical 
We're not very strategic. We do things mechanically, and we don't know why we are using a particular procurement method. So what we are trying to force now is a culture of planning and a culture of analysis. There's also a, an increased emphasis on sustainable procurement. And this will go across the uh, spectrums of social, um, economic things, and also environmental. Uh, value engineering, which was there before, is being emphasized now, again. Uh, for those of you who are tired of uh, our methods, there's also room for you to use your own. Obviously, I think these are subject to an evaluation, but I think by and large, many African countries have evolved their various procurement uh, uh, systems, and I think they are now ready to be used. Uh, we also have what we call use of alternative procurement arrangements. So those of you who are familiar with regional projects may find that on many of these large-scale projects, you've got five or six uh, financiers, each of, you is going to, each of whom is going to ask for you to use their different procurement methods and systems. I think going forward, we have agreed that we, you can now actually only use one, and it will be acceptable also for uh, bank financing. The last bullet is for those of you who uh, fall onto the list of bad people. If you end up uh, in a sticky situation, I think previously the recourse was to debar you. I think the recourse now is depending on what has gone wrong, there could be additional forms of sanctions. So instead of just debarring you for two or three years, perhaps a warning letter could do. I think previously, irrespective of what you did, the sanction was to actually debar you from from bidding. So going forward, I think the future is that um, the World Bank procurement framework will be modern, it will be fit for purpose, it will be tailored, it will respond to our clients' needs, and it will be risk-based. That is the future that we hope to see, and uh, working with yourselves, I'm sure, we can achieve many, if not all, of those. Uh, for those of you who would like to get more information, there's a link that you can go to. There's online training and various um, other resources available, and uh, the link is there below. Now to where the money is. So I'm sure most of you who are consulting engineers would like to know, so where is the money in all of this business, especially in energy and water in Africa? Statistics tell us that uh, there are 48 countries in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. 19 are afflicted by fragility or by outright uh, com conflict. These are wars. 26 are low income, 17 lower middle income, 7 upper middle income, and we have one high income country. So if you are from seashells, we expect you to be buying the drinks because you are apparently from the high income country in Africa. We also have got things that uh, we have put as priorities as an institution for Africa, and they are in the two pillars. Pillar one is on competitiveness and employment. People need jobs. If Africans don't get jobs, it is difficult uh, for you not to fall into a conflict situation. Also, vulnerability and resilience. And water and energy supports uh, competitiveness and employment. Without energy, you cannot have jobs. Uh, as we had heard about before, um, if there's an outage from ESCOM and you run a mine, you have to shut the mine. Okay. So very simply, in terms of numbers, the current portfolio is in energy and water. We have about $18.7 billion in Africa. 11.9 is in energy, and 6.8 is in water. Don't ask me why, but uh, that's the lay of the land. Apparently, the power people are getting their jobs done. The water people are not. Okay. Uh, what we have also done to make this graph perhaps a little bit more um, representative is to remove a large $4 billion portfolio in ESCOM. It's been reduced because um, it distorts the graph. So there's $4 billion 
dollars at ESCOM, but we've removed it to try and make this thing, I think, a bit more um, representative. So if you've got keen eyes, you see that Kenya uh, has got somewhere near 800 million in both water and energy, and um, Angola, somewhere near 200 million in energy, and less than that in water. But I'll not go country by country. I think um, we'll share this, and you can go through it in detail. Now, early on in, in the year, we had a replenishment of what we refer to as IDA, which is the financing that is used to um, support our uh, projects. And of the $75 billion we, we, which was raised, which was a record, $45 billion of it is to be spent here. So $45 billion to be spent in Africa. So that's where the money is, okay? Uh, the graph at the bottom nearly shows you the trends, and what you will see also is that many countries uh, have doubled their share of resources. So countries which were getting 50 million every two or three years will now be getting somewhere close to 100 million, okay? Now, of this 75 billion, how is it shared up? So other regions around the world will get 30 billion. Africa will get 45. Of the 45, 6 billion will be in energy, and 3.5 will be in water. Okay, and um, the graph below also shows the distribution. So again, uh, the energy guys seem to be getting a large chunk. Um, of the financing, and obviously I think this is to try and support um, competitive e economies and job growth. Now, this slide uh, is meant to cause two things. One, to cause those of you who like to bid to be aware of what's going on out there, not to discourage you, but to encourage you. Now, uh, there are two things we, we must also take into mind. It was done from, 40, from 2014, July, until early 2017. So it has removed close to two and a half billion, which went to South African firms on ESCOM, because those contracts were awarded in 2010. Okay, so don't think that um, if South Africa is not here, then they're not getting any share of the contracts. And also, these are for large contracts, more than $5 million. So your typical co consulting assignment is about $3.5 million, and uh, plenty of those are going to South African firms. Okay. Now, as we had heard before, uh, the issue of private sector financing, uh, the money from our institution, from government, and from other institutions is not enough, okay? So what we are all trying to do now is to bring in the money from the folks who sit in uh, Silicon Valley. They sit in a garage, they make billions with apps, and the money goes into some bank account and stays there. It's not going to go into solid waste, it's not going to go into roads, it lies in a large bank account somewhere earning interest. And that's the money which I think needs to be brought into the public space. Now, it can only come there if uh, these wealthy young folk have got some element of comfort, that their money is not going to go some, down some deep, dark hole and never see the, the light of day. So we are w working with um, other institutions and other governments trying to create an, invest an investor-friendly environment also, we need to make uh, people more comfortable with putting money into perhaps non-viable commercial ventures by securities and by various types of uh, instruments, and also seeing how our financing can be blended. The money which comes from the bank, um, the money which comes from the EU, as well as the private sector capital. So in the two sectors, those are the various priorities. Uh, energy, it's generation, hydro, thermal, or renewable. Um, at this point, I think we are not very eager to go nuclear. Uh, transmission and distribution, and also access. 
In the areas of water, it's water resource management, urban water supply systems, and institutional uh, support. In terms of projects uh, in the pipeline, that is the list. I will not go through each. Um, I'm sure you can uh, go through these at your own time. But uh, that is the lay of the land. That is where the money is. So how do you get to know about opportunities uh, for bidding, both as consultants, contractors, or suppliers? Simply, you just go to the heading worldbank.org slash procure. And if you do that, if you go to the website, uh, you will find where it says, uh, actually we've ringed it in red for you. So it's projects and operations. If you click there, there'll be an icon for procurement. If you click there, there'll be an icon for procurement plans. In there, you'll find not just what is going to be uh, procured, but also the estimate, okay? If you'd like to look at the procurement notices, you can also go to the website and click on notices and you can uh, see what is available. Uh, before I go to that slide, uh, those of you who want to even know more about how to bid and are based here, you can sign up with uh, Concost and from BPEC. Usually we do have some awareness um, workshops and meetings with them. So you can always just uh, sign up and then you can come around to one of our uh, presentations. Now, very quickly, I thought we could also discuss with uh, yourselves some recent changes in the areas of environment, social, health, and safety. These things have been brought about really by some glaring failures which have happened, particularly in the transport sector. I think uh, water so far has been spared and energy, but our transport colleagues uh, have found themselves in a very sticky position. Um, sorry, it's not responding. So very quickly, we have six stages of procurement. I'll not, through, I'll not read through each, but there are six. And the basic requirement going forward is that issues of environment, safety, health, and social concerns are addressed adequately at each stage. I think for a long time we've been waiting to try and address these things who are aware, those of you who are supervising our contractors. It's a bit late at that stage. Uh, to enforce and to manage these things turns into a complete nightmare. So when our clients are identifying the various projects which they intend to go into. One of the things they need to look at carefully is do they even have a policy, an objective, something documented with regards to environment, health, and safety, and social? In many cases, they don't, and that's the starting point. So if you don't have a policy, you don't have a strong law around these areas, it's difficult for you to begin to complain that the workers don't have adequate uh, PPE, or that there are other things going on on site. During the analysis stage, we need to all ask ourselves, what's the cost of compliance? If we are asking people to comply with all of these things, how is the market going to react? Also, uh, when we are specifying what is going to go into the various bidding documents, um, have we adequately described what the bidders are going to provide for us to make sure that they, they are capable to comply and they're taking all of these requirements into their bids? Also, when you, when you do receive these bids during bid evaluation, are people mechanically going through this process, ticking and uh, scratching through, or are they looking in detail at what contractors are saying they are really going to do, and perhaps at pre-contract stage to verify that what you think they are going to do is what they are actually going to do. When you begin to manage this contract, it is the reporting and enforcement that um, what you have asked to be done is actually being done. And also a stage to learn. Um, things have gone wrong. I cannot mention 
the actual country names for obvious reasons, but things have gone wrong on many sites. And I think what has come out is that uh, those were not the first time or the uh, first failures. There, there was actually a history of things going wrong, environmentally, socially, and to do with health. I know of a particular project in a country nearby where close to three people um, fell off some uh, scaffolding, each used to fall after like three, three months. And these were uh, fatal falls. They would um, fall and die. And by the time we got to know, we, 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 we were also told, well, but that's man number four. So there's sometimes a history to these things which we don't pick. And I think all of us uh, need to take into account the various le lessons to be learned. Now, the role of yourselves, uh, very quickly, is one slide. Going forward, you are going to see, those of you who are consulting engineers, that uh, there will be an increased focus on ensuring that you too, in your proposals, are taking into account issues of environment, safety, health, and social matters. And uh, you are going to be asked to also provide personnel with the requisite qualifications and knowledge to prove that you are going to take these things into uh, account. For more information on all of these things, please do go to our website. Uh, the last two bullet points are on the revised billing documents which take into account the various issues on environment, safety, health, and social matters. So I thank you, and I hope we'll be part of the problem, the guy with the two wheels, sorry, part of the solution, the guy with the two wheels, not part of the problem, the two guys who are trying to pull something very heavy. Thanks. Thanks.